Hello everyone, we are about to start. Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Here we go. I was a bit rushed setting this up, but here we are. Welcome. Let me see if everything is running smoothly. I hope you can hear me. It's looking good. So today we'll be focusing about values or on values. And it's the week that we're launching the summer term of the shading course meaning next Friday, July 10th, is the deadline for signing up for those of you that want to join the course. And then Saturday, group coaching starts. And the week after, we begin working on Module 1. So everyone that's in the course already will start with Module 1. You do the assignments. And on Wednesday, I'll give a feedback round. For those that are in the coaching, level or coaching group there will be an additional group coaching session on saturday and then the next week we'll do module two so we'll all go to the course together you can't see me you should be able to see me i guess that was uh, the lag 
So it should be fine now. I can see the chat and myself. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the course because we're starting the new term. Um, and I'll teach actually a module from the course, module three, about values. I'll do that class live today. Cool. Thank you, Sham. And we'll, I'll do a demo of doing a value study, which is a super valuable strategy or tool to have to be able to do a value study. So those of you that have taken the course already, this will be familiar. It will be a repeat, hopefully a good one. Um, and I want to share, I did some, some <laughs> digging in the attic. I'm in my parents' house in Switzerland. And you can see behind me a little bit, there are some paintings. So before we get into the class, I want to share that. And because I can't move here, I have a second screen. Let's see if that works out. To get a little bit closer here. One sec. There. So there's three paintings. I think those of you that have been here before have seen this one already. It's a cast painting in oil of one of Michelangelo's sculptures. That was the original that then was uh, cast in plaster. And I was painting the plaster sculpture from life at Angel Academy in Florence about a little over 10 years ago. <laughs> this also from Angel Academy was a figure painting. Let's see, there's a bit of glare. It's hard to get around that in this room but I hope you can see a bit. So this is oil on canvas as well, with the model sitting for us for, I think, four weeks it was, maybe five weeks, working three hours per day from the model, who's just sitting in the same position every day. And then another cast painting. This is Houdon's écorché, meaning a flayed figure. Also a plaster cast of the original sculpture. And this one, the, the special challenge for me was to do the wood down here. And that took quite a bit of time and work, but I really enjoyed it. At some point, it really started to feel like wood. I'm not sure how much this camera picks it up, but there, that's a bit sharper. And this was one of those projects as well where it started to feel like a sculpture. So I was painting, but I, my brain kind of thought I was sculpting, which is the stage I really enjoy. Kind of pushing, finishing, and sculpting with paint. And the understanding that allowed me to do these paintings is what I talk about in the course. That's why I show them, and because I'm in Switzerland at the moment, so I have access to these works. Okay, now let me switch to presentation mode. There's a bunch of things we will talk about today. I think this should bring us to presentation. Let me check. No. Huh, interesting. Okay. So this should work now. One second. My shortcuts broke, but we can do this. Now we should be good. So, again, to mention, next Friday is the sign up deadline for the shading course, and we begin on July 11th. So if you're interested in the course, check out theshadingcourse.com. Now, values. So what are values? Let's begin by that, or with that. Tonal values refer to the brightness or darkness that we see on things around us. So here's a bunch of colors, but if we take out the color information and just look at it in grayscale, now we have values or tonal values. 
So very light values in the top right, and then kind of middle values and dark value over here. And for our brain, the human brain, value is really the most important dimension of color or aspect of color. So if we, this image looks very colorful, but if we actually remove the color and look at it in grayscale, we still understand the image. So you can go quite crazy with color and it still works. But if you are off with the tonal values, the brightness or darkness in your drawing or painting, then the image won't be interpreted correctly by our brains. So value is really important if you're interested in realism. Here's one of my digital paintings from Barcelona Academy. And I'll bring this into Photoshop to show you what I mean. I can change these three things, hue, saturation, and lightness, or this is also a synonym for value. If I change the hue, the head starts looking funny. We get a green skin tone, but you still understand that it's a head, right? I can go all through the color spectrum, changing the hue, but the image itself still works. It's still interpretable, <laughs> still understandable. Let's go back to zero here. Saturation is the color intensity. We can change that dimension as well. We can go desaturated to make a very gray image. And still, you understand the image. We can go very saturated on the other end of the spectrum. It starts looking a bit crazy, especially here we get pixelation. So maybe let's go this far. It's a very saturated image, but you can clearly see it's a portrait. But if we change value or lightness, then either we get completely dark, we can't see the image anymore, or we get completely light and we can't see the image anymore. And these three things, these three sliders that I have to play with here are the three dimensions of color, hue, value, and chroma, or chroma, also synonym, saturation, or intensity. Hue, chroma, value. This is a bit abstract, I think, to move the value slider in this example to just dark and everything or light and everything. So I will discard these changes and show you what I mean by value being really important. If we, let's actually turn this image to grayscale. So we're just working with value. There's no hue information, no chroma saturation information anymore. Now, there's a certain value here being used in the drawing. If I use this halftone value, that same value, if I use it in the wrong place, the image will be confusing. So I can use that value, for example, as the reflected light in the nose. And this is <laughs> super obvious because I'm really exaggerating the point. But if I put that light value there, something looks off now. It's like the underside of his nose is glowing. And we make this kind of mistake all the time in drawing. Usually it's just much more subtle. So you might make your reflected lights a little bit too light. So maybe doing something like this, which is not that striking, but it's still confusing the brain because it's not quite how nature works. Or making those half tones too dark. Let's go with a softer brush. If I use values that are too dark up in the light part of the figure, you kind of understand the image still, but it doesn't look right. Something is wrong. And that is value control and understanding values. So going back here, another fun thing about values is the comparison. So look at the square on the right right now. I don't know if you're on a laptop or a, or a phone, but it should work either way. Center your vision on that square on the right and let your eyes rest for a second. 
just taking in that value. And in the peripheral vision, try to assess the value of the square on the left side. Notice how they're different, how the right is darker and the left one is lighter. That is an optical illusion. So I'll connect the two values right now with the same value. And this still looks like a gradient. It still looks like a light tone merging into a dark tone. So let's make an even background. And you can see that this value is the same value, meaning the two squares at the beginning were the same tone. And this is an expression of the principle that values are relative. It really depends on what you put around a value or a tone. Um, that really determines how we perceive the tone or the, the tones. Sorry, this is a poor, <laughs> poor sentence structure. If you have a value, a tone, what you put around it really affects how you perceive the one that we're looking at. So here I tricked you by putting a gradient in the background. There's a lighter value behind the right square and the darker value behind the left square. And just because the background is different, the value looks different. And that's something that you can train to anticipate and then kind of counterbalance that effect. Here's another great example. Which one is lighter, A or B? You probably know what's coming, <laughs> but B to me, to my eyes, looks much lighter than A, but they are actually the same value. Here the optical illusion works a bit differently. The trick is that value B is inside of a cast shadow. So that creates a different interpretation. So if you're drawing things from observation, like I did on the cast drawings, you need to be able to not make those mistakes or to correct them as you go. And you'll learn with practice that a mid-tone gray in a dark background will look much lighter than it actually is. And the key for me to solving these kinds of problems is to not think in terms of what is the value of a particular point on the model or on the, on the object you're drawing, but instead work with the relationships between different values. So it's not so much about identifying a particular point, but more about how that point is related to other areas of tone. Right. Work with value relationships rather than matching specific values. An important concept to understand is the idea of a local value. That means what brightness is the material itself? Is it a light material or a dark material? So the sculpture on the left and the pot in the middle have different hues and different saturation levels. The pot is more saturated. It's a warmer, more intense color. The left is a more neutral color. But the value is pretty much the same. So the local tone, the local value is a light gray. But then the sculpture on the right has a darker local value. So any material, my shirt, and my skin, any material has a local value. And sometimes, well, the local value might change depending on different parts on the body, for example, but it's a really useful thing to be able to identify. So value or tonal value or tones refers to darkness or brightness. Values are relative and different materials have different local values. If you understand that, you have a good foundation already. Then I want to mention an important tool, which is the value scale. That's an assignment that I had to do as a student and I'm really glad I did it. It's something that I think a lot of people know they should do, but we don't because it seems very tedious, but it's very, very, very useful. So value scale looks like this. It's a sequence of tones that has an equal step 
an equal contrast between each value. You can do a five-step value scale. I think that's the minimum. Um, a th you could do a three-step as well. But five is a good start. If you have a bit more time, then do a nine-step scale. And it's the uneven numbers because that gives you a value in the middle. If we had a 10-step scale, we have five and five, but there's no clear center. But a nine-step scale, you have value number five, which is exactly in the middle. So value five is equally different from value one, which is the darkest that your medium can go, as it is from value nine, which is the value of your paper. And I recommend doing a value scale like this for every medium that you work in. So if you're working with uh, let's say oil paint, do a value scale with oil paint. Mix black and white paint together and maybe a raw umber, uh, warm paint to neutralize the coolness of the black. But I'm getting a bit <laughs> detracted by painting techniques. And make a scale in paint. Make a scale in charcoal. Make a scale in pencil. It's a great way to get to use your or get to know your medium and develop control over your medium. With this, also you have to practice making sharp transitions, which is really important. So between each value step, you want that uh, meeting point not to be blurry and bleeding into each other, but to be clean and sharp, so that you can see the value identity of each value step. Also creating an even tone is something that's very important for realistic drawing. So how, do, how to make a value that's so smooth and clean. I have an article on my website actually for both how to make a value scale, which is at this link here, and also how to create a clean tone. And I'm pretty sure I link to how to make a clean tone from the article about how to make a value scale. So that's a, a thing I recommend doing and it's also an assignment inside the shading course. And we'll, we'll do, the, sorry, we are doing there a value scale like this as well as a value gradient which is a smooth transition from black to white or the darkest that your medium can go to the white of the page. Now the the key skill, the core skill for how to work with values is to be able to make sense of them and organize them. Because if you're looking at a, a cast, something like what I've drawn, or a human body, there's so much going on with values. There's the hair, there's the skin, there's the light creating shadow and light. It's very complex. The way to solve that, and there is a way, there's a way to work very methodically and very confidently in a skilled way, and that way is to organize the values. We refer to the step of organizing values as doing a value study. And at Barcelona Academy of Art, where I teach, every student does a value study for the figure drawings as well as for the cast drawings, cast paintings. And it's a smaller drawing. Maybe I can zoom in here smaller drawing that resolves just the value relationships. Doesn't matter about proportions, the composition is already set usually in the composition sketch. This is just about value relationships and usually we work with four to five value groups, never more than five, you don't need more. You can show any image, no matter how complex that image is, you can simplify it to five value groups. And if you have that grouping established, you have a map of where to go on the actual drawing, on the actual artwork. So the value study is a preparation for the big work, the final work. Here in this case, the student has numbered the, the areas of the drawing with numbers for value groups. And in this case, there are five groups. And I'll walk you through how to do that grouping and I'll do a demo of how to approach it. It looks pretty complicated with the numbers and everything here, but it's a simple concept and very, very useful. 
So in my mind, there are two ways of doing the grouping. If you have a simple image, like one object that you're drawing, you can usually use light logic. And I'll explain what that is. If you have a complex image like this composition with many objects, with many local colors, right, local values, the skin of the center figure here has a much lighter local value than the skin of this figure in shadow, or let's say the coat here. So that if you use light logic, it gets way too complex. But we can say the color or value of the coat here, let's say the coat in light, is the same value, the same brightness, the same tone as probably that skin in shadow. Let me zoom out again. Right, that's pretty close. We can group together the coat in light and the body in shadow. That becomes one value group, one color we can use to paint. And then the leaves of the head here, there's also two values, one in light, one in shadow. Let's say the light up here is the same value group as the hat, as the hat and the clothing of this figure, the hair of this figure. They're all close enough that we can group them. So light logic or value similarity. Let's go into light logic. Here's the process of how I build a cast drawing like this. And also it applies to figure drawings. There's a block in phase where my main concern is proportions. So I start with placement. Uh, let's bring this to Photoshop. It's gonna be a bit easier to zoom in and out. So placement, where I place the drawing on the page, I get that main proportion right of height to width. Then big shapes. I try to establish all the proportions and then establish main transitions, soft edges and sharp edges. Here we're using two values. There's the white of the paper. In this case, it's a toned canvas, but still that's one value. And then the shadows of my subject become the second value. So two values, two tones are being used in the block in phase. The next phase is value grouping. That's where you make the value study. And this is the phase that we'll look at more in detail. Once you have the value relationships established here, we're using three values. The fewer groups, the better. So if you can do it with three value groups, great, awesome. You keep your life more simple. Sometimes it's not possible or it really helps to have four values and really five at the most, but on a subject simple, as simple as this, we just need three or four at the most values to explain it. Once we have that, we go through the modeling or rendering phase where we start building the form, the three-dimensionality. And this, in my mind, goes through three stages of big forms where the volume is established but no details yet. Medium forms, where, for example, the lips are starting to appear. Here the lips are not really there. Here the lips are starting to become visible. The wings of the nose, the ball of the nose is becoming more modeled, more described. And then small forms or finishing, where all, this, all the little details are being included as well. take a deeper dive into the value grouping. If we have a sphere like this, this is, remember, going into light logic. We're grouping values based on what the light is doing with the subject. And most fundamentally, we separate it into light and shadow. There are two families, the light family and the shadow family. And in the light family, we can add, if we have to be disciplined and have as few value groups as possible, the most important group is going to be down here, the dark halftones. Because that's where the value changes most dramatically inside of the light. So it's close to the terminator or the shadow line where light and shadow meet. Right next to it is a dark tone that is 
in the light, but it's quite dark, so it's a dramatic difference. So that's why we include it as a separate group. So we have dark halftones and light halftones. Those are our first two groups. And now we have all the shadow stuff left. How do we make one or two more groups out of all of this? With light logic, you can identify the reflected light and the core shadow. And core shadow is created by the reflected light. So the floor here is giving off some bounce light, some reflected light that's lightening the lower part of the sphere. But the upper right, sorry, upper left part of the sphere is not receiving that much reflected light. So it's staying darker. And that effect of a darker shadow within the shadow family, within the form shadow, we call that the core shadow. There's also the cast shadow. So we have three things there that we should pack into one or maybe two value groups. And if you squint, I think the difference between the cast shadow and the other two is the bigger difference than between core shadow and reflected light. So I suggest we make one group of just form shadow. So ignore the difference between reflected light and core shadow, just group that together and then have another group for, for the cast shadow, which gives us four groups, light half tones, dark half tones, form shadow and cast shadow. And we can use that same, those same names, those same light effects on the sculpture. So step one is to separate light and shadow. And I'll do this with you here. Red means light. And yellow means shadow. So I'll go through and label all these different parts. So this is shadow. Everything in here is shadow. Shadow, shadow. You see there's a bit of a lighter value in here. That is reflected light and that's all part of the shadow family. So that's all shadow. Also up here, that's some reflected light in there, but that's still shadow, shadow, shadow. In the background, we have a big area of cast shadow. That's also shadow family. Here, it's a little bit darker than here, but that's all still receiving direct light. So the shadow begins here. And then the tricky parts are maybe places like this in here. It looks really dark and many people, especially beginners would call that a shadow. They would say this like shadow starts here, but we in the academic tradition, or if you're, if you have a deeper understanding, you're always looking for the terminator, which is here where light meets shadow or the edge of a cast shadow. Cast shadow is the shadow that's being projected, like what is on the background here. All of this is the cast shadow of the sculpture being projected on the backdrop. And in the same way, we have edge of cast shadow here and here, and also on the lip. It's quite soft and subtle, but I would say it's somewhere in here. That's edge of cast shadow. This is also edge of cast shadow here too. This is a terminator. So that means everything in here is shadow family. And that in turn means if we go pick the light color that this is still light, still part of the light family. Here, very obvious, that's light family, light family, light family, light family, light family. The whole background, light, light. I'll paint out this guy so it's not confusing. And then in here, this might be also a bit more difficult to see or understand, but this is also light. The lamp that's illuminating this cast, this, this sculpture, is hitting all of that surface and it is also hitting that nostril. If it wasn't, then we would have a value that's much closer to the rest of the shadows, like something like this. 
and it would only be illuminated by reflected light. Maybe from the side here we get some reflected light as we do on the bottom. But now it is truly in shadow. Since it's not that dark, it is going to be grouped with the rest of the light. So something like this. Now, advanced question for those of you that know a bit more or that have been following. What would you where would you put this guy over here? Is that part of the light family or part of the shadow family? I can't see the chat while I'm sharing the screen here, but I'll give you a second to think about that. Is this light or is it shadow? And you have to use light logic in order to make that call, to make that decision. So everything I explained before with the sphere and comparing, looking for the cast shadow, looking for the terminator or the shadow edge, which case is true here? I would say we have a terminator here, that's a, sh a shadow edge. And this plane is actually curved in such a way that the light is not hitting directly. The light is hitting up here, but then that little crease, the nasolabial furrow, is falling into shadow. And you may ask, why is it so light? It looks more like the side of the nose, which, Dorian, you said that's light. So how come, let me change colors, how come this guy over here is light and then this guy over here is shadow? It's reflected light here that's illuminating the shadow so much that it's starting to look like a half tone. But if we're going with light logic, this is a shadow and it should be grouped as a shadow. And if you're doing a charcoal drawing or a pencil drawing, I would actually recommend that you fill in all the shadows in the beginning with one tone and include this shape as a shadow and leave out this shape as a light. Because that means you understand what is light and what is shadow. You can always lighten this shadow later to show the reflected light. And you can always darken the wing of the nose to show that it's a darker half tone. But start out organized. It will save you a lot of time. Back to presentation mode. So I have this here labeled. That's the first stage in our organization of values. We're separating light and shadow. Then we have a new group, which is dark halftones. So let me bring this up here. And I've already explained this partly, I guess. So dark halftone. Now, this was a light before, but now we're adding another, t another group, another value group. And this is where we will use that value group. This is dark halftone. Down here, where you weren't sure before, that's dark halftone. But dark halftone can only happen inside of the form light. Oh, and I just realized I used the opposite colors. I'm so sorry about that. So yellow is supposed to be shadow and red is supposed to be light. So halftones can only appear in the light family. When you have lighter tones, like in here, the reflected light on the lip, or what did I pointed out before, this guy in here, that cannot be a dark halftone. Dark halftones are where direct light hits. So where else did we identify light family where we can now add dark halftone? Like maybe down here, maybe a little bit on the edge here. Maybe down here, be here. Maybe through here, but it's, it's more the softness of the transition there that's creating that middle tone. And in the background, I guess, you know, these areas as well are a darker mid-tone. They're still receiving light, they're not yet shadow, but we can put a darker tone there. Let's 
Okay, I, want, I thought about whether I should bring this up now or in a moment. I think I'll bring it up now. You'll see the difference in tone from, say, down here in the background to the nose. Those two values are really different. Let me paint out everything else for a second. Right, the nose is quite a bit lighter than the background. So while light logic says that they're both half tones, we'll probably have to group differently so that the values are actually the same. I think I didn't do a good job explaining this, so let me continue and we'll come back to that and make it all work. And I will actually make a value study from zero to bring this, to show you how it works. Then to finish it off, we'll add the final group, which is the cast shadow, which here just means that the shadow here turns from a yellow identified as shadow to now identified blue as cast shadow. So we have four value groups, one, two, three, four, to show that whole image. And I'll do that now from scratch, and hopefully it will make much more sense after that demonstration. So let's start with shadow. Let's pick an average shadow, and I'll tone in all of this with the shadow value. If you follow along, or want to follow along, there's this image uh, available. Wait, no, it's not this image. Uh -huh. If you want to follow along, you can take a screenshot if you're working digitally. But there is an assignment that I have on my website here, which I'll get to in a little bit. So this will be downloadable for you if you want to do this value study exercise. Since I'm here, let me check the chat. Cool. Looks like everything is running smoothly. Back to Photoshop. So I would say don't follow, don't worry about following along for this one. Uh, you'll be probably learning more if you watch how I tackle it and then follow along or do it at home with the other image that's on the website here. So I'm starting by separating light and shadow. I'm picking the average shadow value and I fill in all the shadows with that value. And you can see right now that this looks too, too dark. It looks almost black because my canvas is very light. But I'm trusting that will be okay because I picked the color actually from the original. And I'm filling in everything that is shadow with one flat tone. And if my proportions go a little bit out of order, that's fine because I'm concerned mostly with the value. I'm also saving a little bit of time by having a low contrast version of the image underneath. So I'm painting by numbers a little bit, so I don't have to worry about proportions, and I'm just focused on the values themselves. Okay, all of this is shadow down here. And I'll leave out the nostril, or the wing of the nose, rather. And I think we're almost done with this first step. Did I miss any shadow? Ha! Yeah, I missed this one. This will look very harsh now, very different than the original, but it is I'm following light logic right now. So this should be grouped with the shadows. Notice I'm not filling in the top of the lip here. This might be very tempting to do because we're in this kind of drawing brain mode. We want to outline things. But the way I'm approaching this is much more in a painting kind of thinking where you're looking for big masses of tones and 
this value is still grouped with the light family right now. It's much better if I do this, where I'm absorbing that little tone in the light family, than it is to do this, where I'm grouping that with the shadow. See how kind of wrong and rough and aggressive that looks compared to this. This is going towards simplicity. If I do this, it's going towards fragmentation and chaos. And we're trying to organize things, so simplicity is good. Notice I'm also grouping together the whole shadow here. So even though part of it is on the lower lip and part of the shadow is on the upper lip, I don't care. It's just shadow. It's all shadow, so it all gets filled in together. All the shadow. And then all the light becomes one group as well. I hope that makes sense. Now let's go to the next step, which is adding the dark halftones. And dark halftone value would be maybe something like this. So yeah, that feels a bit too dark. Let's go more like this. And when I see a big proportional mistake, I'll fix it. Like this was looking too wide now. So I'll cut it slightly. But really, it's not about shapes. It's much more about values. Where else can I use this value of dark halftones? Maybe down here. Down here. And my mind is starting to consider the background. So I have a new value group here that I'm using. Actually, let's do this. Let's make a palette over here. I have the white of the canvas. And then I added the shadow. So I have light family, shadow family. Now I'm adding a third value in the middle. So let's move the shadow down. And this half tone value here. So we have three tones, three, that we can use to show this image. Let's try to actually use the half tone value group to fill in the, sh the background. So while I still use three values only, now my value study, my sketch, is starting to look much more like the original image. And that is really my goal before the relationship of the background to the sculpture was not correct. The background was way too light. And what my goal is, is to establish the value relationships. So with these three groups, I think this isn't right now the best job I can do to show the image. Let's do this. That's the shadow and that's half tone and background. Light half tones, dark half tones. And form shadow. And you'll see towards the bottom, now we have too much contrast there, but maybe we don't have enough value groups. But let's find out if somehow we can create a darkness down here. Right, the, the temptation is to notice the difference that it's much darker here, there's a gradient going down. So you, I mean, I feel that. I want to create that gradient now. 
But as soon as you do that, as soon as you allow yourself to add all these additional values, you are creating complexity and you're probably getting lost with your values. That's what happens to, to us. If you have a lot of experience, you can do everything in one go. But what you're really doing is compressing many decisions because you've made them so many times, you've gotten really good at them. But in the beginning, it's I found much better to stay disciplined and take it one step at a time and keep things simple for yourself. So I will resist the temptation of adding tone down here and stay with my three values until this looks good and then add my fourth value. And I think we can bring the shadow up here around something like this. And I will talk about gradients or soft edges in a moment, which is a topic that there's some, <laughs> some disagreement about in the academic drawing world. See, this should come a bit higher. Dark half tone value, maybe in there. Okay, now I'm, I'm drawing, like I'm fixing proportional mistakes. Uh, I think I'm doing a bit too much, so I'm gonna stop. I think it's close enough. But where else can we use dark half tone? If you're thinking sculpturally, then wherever the, ter the form turns into shadow, can put some dark half tone before that turn happens so down here would be a good place up here when it becomes very thin like we can put a dark half tone transition up here but this is now so thin and subtle that i would just ignore it for now look for the places that make that uh, where your stroke makes the biggest difference This is economy of mark making, which is also a sign of a master, I think, where you're putting the brush strokes where they matter so that in a limited amount of time you can do, you can create something that communicates more. You're using time effectively. Okay. I notice my brain wanting to have some separation of the sculpture and the background. And I have to tell myself it's okay for now. I have three groups, so I have to do everything I can with the three groups. And then we'll add the fourth group. Which will give us that, that separation actually. So scanning everything i think we're getting close to having placed all the dark half tones where it needs to be i will not place dark half tone anywhere in here because that is all reflected light that will stay in the shadow value so let's go to the last step now and add the cast shadow or the darkest dark so that'll be all of this down here maybe in here that is an occlusion shadow, another type of shadow, but I think it's not necessary. Let's see. I'll pick that color, we'll expand our palette. So there's now our fourth value group. Actually, let me number these. Oops. Hard to see. I'll make a little trick. I'll create a cast shadow for the text here so we can actually read it there. Okay, so one more value group for the cast shadow.
and I hope you can see that this is all quite straightforward, right? I'm just adding more value groups one by one. Here, maybe let's see if we can add, add the shadow value. Aha, see there, good. So I want some darkness down here. And if I color pick the shadow of the cast itself, I can use that value pretty well down here. And this part here is tricky because that's a very slow, sudden, sorry, not sudden, the opposite of sudden, very slow, gradual transition from one tone into another, from one, one group to another. And in these cases, if you're doing it very consciously, if you're making a decision to create a gradient, to create a soft transition, in my opinion, that's okay. I think that is good because what I'm interested in is the effect of the image. Let me jump to this slide for a second. By the effect, I mean this on the top right. That's an image by Andrew Loomis, a fantastic teacher. He wrote some excellent books. The effect is what you're after. If the effect is off, then you're continuing your drawing, but you're just gonna build a house on top of a shaky foundation and the house is probably gonna collapse. But if you have a drawing laid in or a value study that looks like this, you have a strong foundation. You can build your house on that and it will stand and last. A few other examples of value compositions that just show the effect of the image. So in the same way of the effect, if I bring that dark value up here and I create a sharp edge, I am misinterpreting the effect. I am creating an effect, overall compositional effect, that's very different on my value study than from what is going on in my subject. So in the school of Dorian, <laughs> I approve of creating a gradient here. But do it carefully, know that you're creating a gradient. And I'm not going to darken slightly arbitrarily the rest of this image or the rest of the background. I can see it's darker on the left than my background, but I will stay focused and organized and disciplined and say this is my value group number two up here same as this same as everywhere that value appears that's all this guy here so if i start darkening that group in some places i'm confusing myself and that difference that subtle difference from on the left let's go back uh, this tone compared to this tone. Mine is a little bit lighter. That I will accept. That's the cost of simplifying the image. Right? We're getting an organized statement of the value relationships. And what I give up in return is 100% precision of my values everywhere in the image. It's not possible. If I'm simplifying, I have to sacrifice differences in some places. And this is a place where I'm sacrificing the difference in order to get a good organized value study. Maybe this is better here, so we're not on top of the image so much. Now, related to that, what I just did, kind of approving of that gradient, I think there are a few other places where it makes sense to soften the edge, right? Where we have a very sharp edge right now. And if we soften it a bit, it will create an effect that's much more representative of my image. And I would seek out the softest edges, the softest transitions and make those happen. So I think that's maybe down here. And I'm using the mixer brush in Photoshop to do that. That is probably down here. Uh, 
right? It's quite soft there. Also here, same that we did on the left. I'm going to do on the right a subtle gradient. Something like this. In the nose, I think I can stay fairly sharp here, but I'll soften going up. You can use the mixer brush or you can also paint like this. And I have to be careful. I don't want to be sucked into rendering and modeling. That's not the point of this, but the point is to create an effect that's more feeling like my original image. So I will stop very soon. This is very soft up here. Not this edge, that is a very sharp edge on the model itself. But down here we can soften. It's really a mental thing. As long as you're staying organized, as long as you're aware of what your groups are and where they are, you should be fine. Zooming out is a big help for proportional things, corrections. Okay, I think that's probably good enough. There's the last thing, uh, the last consideration, which is this shadow. And there, there are two mindsets, two, two attitudes. One is like, nope, it's shadow, keep it shadow. And the other one is, well, it's shadow and I'm aware of it, but it's so light over here that it ruins the effect of my study. Like this just looks wrong over here. So understanding that it's shadow, I will group it with this value group of the dark half tones because it just represents the effect visually much better. And that is my approach. You can pick the side <laughs> you, you choose. I think I'm aware enough of this and I know it's shadow, but I'm grouping it with the halftone value. The most important thing is that you just stay organized with your groups. So if I want to make it lighter, I have to make it lighter exactly this amount. Like stay, choose one of the values that we have on our palette, one of our value groups. And that's it. That is a value study. It's a little ugly, it's a little wonky, but it doesn't matter. What matters is the value relationships, and those look pretty good overall. So that was a demonstration of using light logic to organize values. I'll mention using value similarity, but I won't do the whole demo. 
there is a demo in the course and actually I have this yeah <laughs> a little bit of advertising if you don't know about the shading course what I'm doing today right now is teaching one of the modules from the shading course today in the live stream and it's module 3 about values and on Friday registration closes for the summer term and next week we'll begin with module 1 of the course and I'll give feedback every week if you go to theshadingcourse.com there's a video where I explain more about the course I changed the pricing slightly well let me say this first the three most important things about the course I think is that there's feedback on your assignments so everyone who's taking the course can upload work for feedback right now I'm able to give most people feedback but as it grows I will have to pick the uploads where I see um, mistakes or issues that will be most useful for everyone taking the course but feedback is a really important part of what we're doing then there's a community so we have a discord server which is right here where you can upload your assignments and I'll give feedback there too you can ask questions people respond to each other's assignments and I just saw this one which I thought was great from Jocelyn it's an ambient occlusion study so she made a drawing and then added ambient occlusion to it which is a type of shadow that I discuss in the course and anyone who's in the course gets access to the community here so every module has a channel or a thread and people post their assignments and then I worked really hard to make things as clear as possible to transmit the, emo the, the emotion, maybe emotion, but the, the information in as short a time as possible. So there's a lot of free stuff on YouTube and ebooks and PDFs that you've probably downloaded. And I enjoy when I see a course or a video where someone took the time to make the concept understandable. And I enjoyed myself doing that work of refining, 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 and distilling the information. So the videos, the lessons themselves are actually very short. So what I'm doing today in probably 45 minutes, you'll be able to watch a edited, produced version of that that takes maybe 20 minutes. So you get the information quickly and then you can focus on actually applying the information in the assignments. Uh, you can preview the seven modules. There's an eighth module in production at the moment and I'll keep adding to this course. It's really my baby that I've worked on the last 10 years and the last two years more intensively. And I'll keep working on this course and refining it and adding content. So you can watch previews for every module and then there are three ways three options one is you just get access to the course which includes feedback as well then second option if you want to work more intensely with me you can sign up for the group coaching there will be it's limited to 10 people and the difference between these two is that in the second option you're guaranteed to have feedback on all your assignments so if you upload five images, I will look at all of them. I'll do paint overs and yeah, you're guaranteed feedback. We're also meeting every Saturday for the small group coaching. I will set more personal goals about your artwork, like where you want to go, if you want to apply for a school, if you want to get commission work as an artist, if you want to do portraits, anything like this we'll set those goals and work towards those goals and weave those goals into our work over the eight weeks and then i have been advised to offer a private option so those of you that want to work really intensely with me one-on-one -on -one, there's the option on the right where i'll do up to two meetings per week during eight weeks We'll go through the shading course as well and focus even more on your personal 
goal that you have that you want to work on during the two months. Then, this is important to me, I know a lot of people don't have that many resources, especially right now. I am definitely feeling that myself as well. So there's the option for 29 euro a month, which by the way, if you're confused by the euro sign, I'm sorry, it's a limitation of my platform and I'm trying to change it to dollars and I will eventually. I know more people are from the US that are taking the course, but it's about the same. It's about $29 as well. You can get access to the whole course and the feedback and the community for that amount. You can cancel any time. If you're working really intensely, you can probably do the course in a few weeks if you're going at your own pace. So I hope that helps those of you that can't afford the regular tuition. And then if 29 a month is too much, which I know for some of you, depending on your circumstances of where you live or what happened to you, what other expenses you have, kids or whatever, get in touch and I'll set you up with a scholarship account. And I think what I'll do is uh, $1 plus, so you can choose your amount. It's $1 minimum because I think everyone can afford $1 uh, per month. And if you can't, let me know, we'll find a solution. I really, this has been a labor of love, this course, and I want it to be out there and I want people to have access to it. So. I hope that makes sense and helps and otherwise here's some frequently asked questions you can look through that at your own time i want to give a quick look at the course platform itself so when you log in when you sign up here are all the modules and the lessons and module three how to control values is what i'm doing today so what are values you will recognize and this that's basically the lesson that I gave today, but I did it live for you here. And then there are assignments like the value study. I describe the steps of the assignments. I will add demonstrations um, as soon as I can in the coming months. You can download the project images and then upload your assignment to the Discord community, which again is over here. So let's see module three values. You'll see people do their value scales, for example, in different media and practicing all these things that I've been talking about. Value studies, all the good stuff. Okay, I hope that's, that makes sense. I think that's enough for, for me explaining the course. Let's go back here. And I think, up 15 minutes left until one hour and a half, so that sounds doable. Let's look at value similarity as a way to organize values. So light logic is if you have a simple subject and you can just think about, is it half tone, is it light, is it shadow? And those become your value groups. But if you have a more complex image like this, then we have to use value similarity. Let's remove the color. So we're just looking at tones. And then I'm going to do something which I love doing, which is to do the median filter in Photoshop. And what the median filter does, it's spelled like this. You find it in filters, noise, median filter inside Photoshop. It simplifies the image but it keeps all the values the same and it keeps some of the sharp edges. So this is the effect, right? Andrew Loomis up here. That's the way in which you want your brain to look at the image in a simplified way. Because if we're looking at it like this, we can see that the pants are pretty similar to the tree up here. And that cape, the cloth, as I said before, is pretty similar to the skin in shadow. So we're, we can start to group things together visually. And the way you're grouping is again with five values. In this case, you can start with three. You'll probably find you'll need more. So you add a fourth. And then if it's not enough, you can add a fifth. Don't go beyond five. 
I think five is the maximum number of values that you need for doing a value study. Once you have the study, you have all the value relationships. If they're all calibrated well, you're good to go. You can add all the values you want, but you have a strong foundation. You're organized. Again, my, my, my <laughs> gospel of the value study, the benefit is speed. Try it out. If you're doing a, a, an involved artwork that's going to take a few weeks to do, take a day to make a value study. It will save you a lot of time. If you're doing drawing without a value study, it's messy and you'll go in circles. If you do a drawing with a value study, you can go straight ahead with speed. And of course, sometimes in drawing, you will want to create ways for yourself to discover things. You're not always interested in the most straightforward, efficient way. Sometimes you want to experiment and play and create a mess, and that's all good. What I'm talking about with the value study is if, you're, if you have a clear goal, and it is to draw something from observation, then doing a value study will be like having a straight road with no traffic where you can go, go for the finish, go for creating that, that drawing. So this is the image for those of you that want to do the assignment. It's on my website. You can take either a screenshot of this right now. I'll wait for a second. And it is also on my website. Not here, but here. On dorinat.com slash life. You can download that image here. So now let me switch back to the chat and let's see if there's any questions. Loomis was the bomb. Yeah, I love Loomis. So we have a few minutes for questions. Feel free to put them in the chat. And maybe if I look over here, there's less lag. No, there won't be less lag because what I'm saying has to travel through the interwebs to reach you first. And hey everyone, it's good to see you. Good to see your names in the chat. You see there's a few students of the shading course already here. Oh yeah, one thing I wanted to do is show some of the student work. So maybe while my question about your feedback travels to you, I can do that. Back to share. So here's an assignment about identifying half tones and shadows. So the orange buttons or uh, marks are all dark halftone, identified as not being shadow, but being dark halftone group. Then this is work from Zach. He's one of the coaching students. The image on the left is more or less where his skill in shading was at when he started. And he just finished this image on the right, which is really just fun to see for me. He has made a huge step forward in his understanding of how light and form works to convey, convey uh, his concept art in a much more real and engaging way. Uh, okay, these are the images from Juslin. They sometimes don't show well in Bridge, but here's some value studies that she did of different images. And you can see that simplicity looking for the effect. And that's something that took her a few steps and I appreciate about Jocelyn that she works really hard and she redo, redoes the assignments until she gets it, which is really great to see. This is an assignment about inventing values. We're using a method to find out if your light value, your local value is this, how do you find your shadow value? There's a very simple 
system method for that. And this one we've seen already. Then one assignment is called draw the perfect egg. And Sham did this one. He might have refined it from here, I'm not sure. Uh, is there another egg? Yes, over here. Thomas has done this egg, which is looking pretty good. Studying these principles on simple forms that then you can apply them to more complex things. We're also studying movie frames and analyze the lighting. So we make these little light probes to try to understand the light direction. And in this, in this example, here's a paint over from me that I did during one of the feedback sessions. And value scales, we've seen these already. Practicing perception and control with pencil and white chalk. And then creating an object, a head like this from imagination and inventing the shading on it. That's the last module at the moment. Where you understand light and shadow so well that you can create an object and you can shade it from imagination. Okay, let's go back to the chat. Let's see. IB is asking, do you have examples of how you do quick figure drawing where you directly work with shadows and tones? Uh, I don't. Maybe. Well, I have a step-by-step -step example. I'm not sure if that is what you were looking for. In quick sketches where there's really no time to do things step by step, but you have to do everything at once, I would do something like this. Let me pull this up here. So this is a mass-based approach where um, it's not here. Sorry. So instead of doing a a placement stage, big shapes, block in, the kind of underpainting, and then a separate value study, and then big forms, medium forms. I compress everything into kind of everything at once, just working big to small. That is the one thing that doesn't change. I work big to small, big things first. So here I put a background in that's roughly representative of the background that was behind the model. This was done from life. So background, and then drawing the figure with a slightly darker tone, then placing roughly color estimates and value estimates. And in a way, I'm doing value grouping. I have a value for figure in shadow. In this case, it's, it's a hue value chroma combination, like, like any color is a combination of those three things. Hue, meaning over here, it's a red-orange value, meaning it's pretty dark. You can go up and down for value. And chroma, saturation, left to right. It's fairly chromatic here, so maybe something like this is my figure in shadow color. Here I have more of a dark halftone and a light halftone. And I just put those in and even create soft transitions to show some of the form right from the start. So that is big value color relationships and then some general shading. Working big to small, I added another material, another local color for the fabric that was hanging from the model's head. And then medium forms, just refining a bit more. And then small forms, getting into the details and then a separate finishing stage where I got into some of the texture on the fabric some specular reflections on the skin. But this was very fast. That was maybe, well, very fast. <laughs> very fast for some people. Uh, I think it was probably a two hours of a three hour session and then another one or two hours. So f let's say four hours total for this. And the approach would be the same if it was grayscale. And I think the approach would also be the same if it was traditional media. 
this is digital painting in Photoshop. But if you're working with charcoal, I would go, I would work the same way, just being more careful that I'm not putting any dark marks anywhere where there's going to be light. So I want to protect these places where there will be a light value. And I would do that on a white sheet of paper, just making a line drawing. I would start probably very lightly, just sketching in where this figure goes. And then sketching in the shadow shapes. Lightly, especially with charcoal, because you, it's hard to go back sometimes. If you get too dark. So all the legs are in shadow. I'm basically having two tones now, two values. And gradually as I get more confident, I'll add more darkness to the places that will be in shadow. So the whole background will be in shadow. And I'll basically work like this. I hope that makes sense. So drawing, drawing the shadow shapes and then from there starting to model and turn the form, big forms first and then medium forms. And just going a bit too small until it's finished. Let's go back to chat. All right. Looks like no more questions at the moment, and we're also at the end of 90 minutes. I hope this was helpful, also for those of you that are taking the course already, and for those of you that are not, I want to invite you to join us. You can sign up until Friday, and then we'll close the coaching options, and we'll start module one next week, and then go for eight weeks. If you have any questions about the course or anything, there's a chat function on the website and you can email me and chat. Until then, I wish you happy drawing and stay safe, take care. See you soon.